As I recall, we ended up on page 10 last time. Does that sound right? And I think we were getting ready to talk about the competitive factors that drive branded footwear sales and market share. Does that sound right? Okay, so first of all, know that there are 13 factors. Five of those factors affect both wholesale sales, footwear retailers, retailers and online sales at company websites. Uh, five only affect the wholesale and three only affect the internal or online. Which one of those, which five of those do you think are the most important? Yeah, the ones that affect them all. And so we're going to talk about those first five first. And the uh, number one is the SQ rating. We talked a little bit about this. Footwear shoppers consider this widely available and much publicized annual SQ rating. So the various brands of footwear compiled by the International Footwear Federation to be a trusted measure of how the company's footwear offers compare on styling and quality against competing brands. Market research indicates that SQ ratings are generally the second or third most important factor, along with breadth of product selection. Okay, so now you've got two hints here. One, uh, SQ is important, and then breadth of product selection. What does that mean about the number of models? Higher is better or lower is better? Higher, higher is better. In shaping consumers' choices of which footwear brand to purchase, a company whose SQ rating constitutes, let's see, sorry. A company's SQ rating in a region is above the all company average SQ rating, thus enjoys an important competitive benefit, a competitive advantage on the style and quality aspect of its footwear brand, whereas below average constitutes a disadvantage. The more a company's SQ rating in a region is above the all company average, the more that footwear shoppers in the region are attracted to purchase the company's brand, unless the company's higher SQ rating is undermined by number one, charging a price premium for the added styling quality that the buyer considers too high or not worth the extra cost. Okay, now let's ask this. Can you charge more for a good shoe? Yeah. Can you charge whoop, 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 crazy money for a good shoe? No. Number two, unfavorable comparisons against rivals or other buyer relevant features such as comparatively few models, styles for buyers to choose among, brand advertising, mail-in rebates, the appeal of celebrity endorsers, etc. So, common problems here um, with finance students. One, they know that setup and teardown is a problem with, it creates costs. So they want to run as few models as possible. They don't want to spend money on advertising. They don't want to do celebrity endorsers. Uh, they don't want to do the other stuff that actually helps you to sell shoes. So don't fall into that trap yourself. Now, by the way, you've got to be, if you want to do well with SQ rating, you have to be above the industry average. Do you know what the industry average is going to be? No, you only know what it was last time, right? And so you're basically having to make a guess. Are people going to massively improve their SQ ratings? If so, and you want to be above that average, then you have to work even harder to get your SQ where you want it to be. Okay, number two, number of models and styles. Com companies offering comparatively fewer models and styles than rivals risk losing sales and market share to competitors offering greater selection unless they offset their narrower selection with other appealing competitive attributes such as lower price, higher SQ rating, higher appeal of celebrity endorsers, and so on. By the way, everything we're talking about here is called a satirist pair of argument. This is your Latin lesson for the day. Ceteris paribus simply means all else equal. So, for example, I say ceteris paribus, if you exercise more, you will lose weight. Now, when I say that, what I'm saying is if I exercise more, but I don't increase my intake of calories at the same time, if I keep my number of calories the same, and I exercise more, then I'm going to lose weight. And that's the way everything that we're looking at here is. Higher SQ rating is better if everything else still stays the same. You could change something else that would actually negate 
the positive benefits of having a higher SQ rating. And the same is true with this number of models. You could have a great number of models, but if they've all got low SQ ratings, who wants to buy them, right? It's a bunch of junk. Okay, number three, brand advertising. A company's aggressiveness in promoting its footwear in each geographic region is judged comparatively stronger when its annual brand advertising expenditures exceed the all company regional average. So this is just like SQ. Uh, we think we're, we're doing better if we have higher than the average. Once again, we don't know what that average is going to be. It's a prediction and in fact, um, I'm going to teach you an industry term. You guys know what a swag is? Okay, so let's start with a wag. A wag is a wild ass guess. Wild ass guess, and don't get excited. The ass here we're talking about a donkey, a wild donkey, right? A wild ass guess. Okay, now, wild ass guessing is insane. Don't just do that. Don't do just that. So what's the S stand for? The S stands for scientific. That's a scientific wild ass guess. You might also have heard it called in, uh, in statistics called the expected value. Every day, if you check the weather, guess what? You're looking at someone's scientific wild ass guess, right? Does that make sense? So what are you going to do? So what's the naive swag? Well, everybody's going to, the average is going to be the same next time as it was this time. Do you think that's usually a good plan? No. Trying to figure out where things are going, what people are trying to accomplish, uh, is going to help you to make better swags than just the naive assumption that everything's going to stay the same. Questions? Okay. With cross, when cross rival differences on all other competitive factors are on balance close to equal, Sarah Paribus, among company rivals in a region, uh, the company's above average current year branding, brand advertising experience expenditures will outsell companies with below average current advertising expenditures. Notice this is per region. Do you think spending money on advertising in North America helps you in Asia Pacific? Not one bit. Appeal of celebrities endorsing the company's <coughs> brand. The influence of the company's celebrity endorsers is, of course, magnified by higher brand advertising and search engine advertising. I can't emphasize that enough. If you go out and hire the best celebrity endorser on earth and you don't spend any money on advertising, you basically wasted your money. So don't do that. Companies with more influential celebrity lineups in a region enjoy an advantage in attracting buyers to purchase their brand in either retail stores or online as compared to regional rivals with less influential celebrity endorsements or no celebrity endorsements at all. Now, let's talk about celebrity endorsers. Here in the United States, um, do are we huge soccer fans? Not really, not really. The rest of the world, that's the sport of the rest of the world, right? Um, if I say the name Lionel Messi, do you know who that is? He's like a big old soccer player, or they would call it football. Now, the question is this, do you think having Lionel Messi as a celebrity endorser in the United States would be as effective as having him in uh, Latin America? No. no. So it turns out that these endorsers have different appeal to different regions. And in fact, one of my uh, student teams who won said one of the things that they did is they looked and saw where their marketing efforts were weak, so a region, and then they looked for celebrity endorsers that had especially high appeal in that region. And so by doing so, they were making really wise use of their celebrity endorsement money. Does that make sense? Okay, image and brand reputation. The image rating for each company in the industry is based on number one, it's global average branded SQ rating, number two, it's global average market share of total footwear sales, and number three, it's actions to display corporate citizenship and conduct operations in a socially responsible manner over the past four to five years. 
past four to five years. So with this socially responsible stuff, can you just like throw a little bit of money at it once and expect to see results? No, you have to stick at it with what, four to five years before you start to see any results? Does that make sense? I mean, because you could be, let's think of a terrible company. Name a terrible company. BP. BP Bridge Petroleum. Okay, and why are they terrible? Because of what they did in the Gulf? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's assume the people at BP are evil bloodsuckers. And now they've come out with, and they actually did. They're like, now we're investing in renewables. Do you buy it? No. What if they did it for two years in a row? Do you buy it? No. They're going to have to stick at it for four to five years before you start to say, well, maybe they have turned over a new leaf, at which time they'll probably have another well get sheared off in the Gulf of Mexico and we'll be right back to where we were. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Prior year company, uh, let's see. Co prior year company image ratings, brand reputations of rival companies have a moderately strong influence on brand choices and uh, footwear buyers in the upcoming 12 months. In other words, uh, there's a little bit of a reputational thing there. If you had a good image rating last year, people are slightly more likely to buy your stuff this time around. And it's interesting, this brand loyalty, that's basically what we're talking about here. Do you think it's higher for some things than other things? Yeah, uh, when I was a kid, uh, there were big fights between the Coke Pepsi, Coke people and the Pepsi people. And then there were fights between the Ford people and the Chevy people. And, and some of the stuff I can't say, but they would say Ford stands for fix or repair daily and stuff like that. And there would be fights, right? Um, do you think athletic footwear has that same brand loyalty? You know, probably not as much. My default is to always buy the same brand, but when I can't find any of their shoes that fit me anymore, I am really easy to switch. By the way, have you guys noticed that if you find a pair of athletic shoes that you like, you damn well better buy four pair of them because the next time you go to buy them, they won't be available because they just keep changing the models so often. Okay. Companies with prior year image ratings above the industry average have a meaningful edge over rivals with below average image ratings and attracting buyers to purchase their brand and recruiting additional retailers to stock and merchandise their footwear brand for a period of one year. What do you think is better for you to have more people selling your shoes or fewer? Yeah, you'd always want more. And so this, uh, this image rating is gonna help you attract more retailers, so that's important. But this, this only lasts for one year. After that, uh, it's what have you done for me lately? The importance of a strong brand reputation in attracting buyers is big enough that companies with comparatively weak reputations must exert enough extra effort <coughs> on the other 12 competitively relevant factors to boost overall buyer appeal uh, for their brand and overcome their image reputation disadvantage. When weak image companies significantly improve the overall buyer appeal and competitiveness of their athletic footwear from one year to the next, they can win market share from strong image rivals despite having an image rating disadvantage. You guys may not remember it, but Hyundai used to be known for making absolutely junk cars. How did they eventually get to be one of the biggest automakers? They started making higher quality cars and people started finding out about it. Okay. Should companies with once weak brand reputations continue to improve their overall image ratings over a period of several years, they can turn a liability of weak brand reputation into a strong brand reputation and a competitive uh, asset. Notice that this is also requiring continuing efforts. There are no magic bullets to fix a weak reputation. Now let's talk about um, the three things that are involved in your image and brand reputation. Number one, your SQ rating. Can you totally impact that for the coming period? You absolutely can. Number two, uh, the global average market share of total footwear sales. Yeah, you can really change that from period to period. Um, and both of those so far, we're talking about things that align with the goal of financial management. 
But what about number three? Do you think corporate social responsibility is necessarily uh, required to maximize shareholder wealth? Now, noting that business ethics, we, we say in business ethics, that the, the basement of ethics is the law, right? And so we're going to assume that we are in, uh, in agreement or we are in sync with all the laws and regulations. We're not uh, making kids make our shoes. We're not poisoning the environment. We're doing all the stuff that we're supposed to do. So the corporate social responsibility spending on top of that do you think it's necessarily going to give you a big boost? No. Any questions on that? Okay. Let's see here. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the five that only affect the wholesale sales. Number one is the average wholesale price for branded footwear sold to retailers. How a company's average wholesale price for branded footwear in each region compares to the wholesale prices of a competing company is an important competitive factor. Once again, we're talking about a ceteris paribus argument. You can have really cheap shoes, but if they're crap, people don't necessarily want to buy them. Charging a higher price than rival companies puts a company um, at a price-based competitive disadvantage against lower price rivals, whereas charging a lower price gives you an advantage over higher price rivals. Big cross-company price differences matter more than small differences and much more than tiny differences. So if you're only a little more expensive or a little bit cheaper, probably not a big deal. But when you start to see some pretty big gaps, then it starts to impact you pretty big. But the more important price-related consideration affecting a company's unit sales, per market, unit sales market share is the amount by which its wholesale selling price to footwear retailers in each region is above or below the all-company average in each geographic region. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we're looking at the average of what the competitors are doing. And once again, the more that you are above, this average, the worse it's gonna hurt you, the more you're below it, the more it's gonna help you, yada, yada, yada. Okay, let's see. Unless the buyer, uh, buyer appeal of the company's lower price is undercut by the company having an unattractively low SQ rating and or comparatively few models, uh, styles for Bars choose among and comparatively weak reputation, brand image, fewer retailer stocking. And so in other words, we're back to this whole uh, Ceteris Paribus thing. You can have the lowest price out there, but if you stink at everything else, it's really not going to help you. It is important to understand that the size of any company's pricing disadvantage or advantage versus rivals and the resulting loss or gain in unit sales and market shares can be decreased or increased by its competitive standing versus rivals on the other competitive factors. So, if your shoes are slightly more expensive, yet you have a higher SQ rating, might not be a problem. I think sometimes this thing goes to sleep. Man, it is bound and determined not to look at me. Okay. Any questions on price? Number two. The number of retail outlets carrying the company's brand. The number of retailers in a region desirous of carrying a company's brand in the upcoming years based on four factors. Number one, the current market share of branded footwear sales in that region. So once again, we're looking at regional differences. Number two is regional SQ rating for branded footwear. And so the higher your market share is, the higher your SQ rating is, the more people will want to carry your shoes. Number three, the number of weeks it takes retailers in the region to receive the pairs they have ordered. By the way, we can choose to do one through four weeks on our deliveries. What do you think makes us most attractive to retailers? Short yeah, the shorter the better. Okay, and we'll get to that here in a second. And number four, the degree of merchandising support that the company provides to regional retailers stocking of its footwear, and we'll talk about that too. So let's talk about this number of weeks. While retailers can easily live with a four-week delivery time on footwear orders, 
Manufacturers can boost the appeal of their brands and more easily convince retailers to carry their brands by cutting the delivery times on the orders to three weeks, two weeks, or one week. Companies who delivery to- whose delivery times in a region are shorter than the above com- whole company average uh, have a dis- an advantage. And so that's just like everything else. If you're doing better than your competitors, you have an advantage. Um, and that's because the retailers are less likely to run out of particular styles and sh- sizes and styles. So for instance, let's say that you guys have some amazing pink cross trainer and it hits the shelves and, and it's an amazing thing and people love it. What is the store, what's gonna happen to the inventory on the shelf? What's, oh, come on. It's gonna decrease. It's, yeah, it's gonna decrease. And so then the, the shoe retailer, what are they gonna do in response to that? They're gonna order more shoes. Now, you say, oh, that'll be one week. And they're like, yeah, okay. And then you say, that'll be four weeks. They're not as happy, right? So does that make sense? It helps them to manage their inventory better. Now, on the other hand though, what does it mean about your inventory? Your inventory is gonna have to be higher to be able to put those shoes out as quickly as you can. By the way, with a four week lead time, I'll bet I could make those shoes and ship them, right? I wouldn't have to have them in inventory, but with a one week lead time, I doubt that's the case. Okay, support offered to retailers in merchandising and promoting the company's brand. Such support can uh, include providing in-store displays and signage, providing helpful information about styles, models, and performance features, supplying brochures, detailing shoe construction, and other noteworthy features, making it easy for retailers to place orders online and keeping retailers posted on styles or models that have newly that are newly introduced, discontinued, or about to be introduced, discontinued. In short, footwear retailers and their store personnel want to deal with a footwear supplier that works closely with them to boost sales and that are easy to do business with. Companies that provide amounts of retail support um, above the all company average in a region have an advantage, all else equal. Okay, so let's give some example of retailer support. Uh, my wife and I took a group of students out to Will Fisher Distributing. Do you guys know what Will Fisher is? Yeah. Yeah. What's the? Is that a toy company? No, no. Uh, yeah. Fisher, that's Fisher Price. Oh. So Will Fisher Distributing. Some of you may enjoy their products. They're the local Anheuser Busch distributorship. And when we went out there, uh, I was amazed to find that they had a room with these fancy machines, and all it does, all they do all day long is to create this merchandising support stuff for the stores that sell their brands. And so if you go to a place and you see a big banner that's like Happy Fourth of July and it's got, um, let's say, I'm not gonna pick Bud Light since they're being picked on here lately. Uh, So Michelob, Michelob, they still make that? That was big in the 70s. Okay, back to the story. They've got this big thing that says, well, that came out of, that's retailer support. Another thing that they do is create the price signs that go on the doors of the coolers. And so the the retail store doesn't have to do those. And by the way, those price signs that are on the doors of the cooler, are those bigger and sexier than the little tags that are on the shelf in the, the wall thing? Yeah, and so they're not only helping the retailer sell more, they're also helping themselves by the retailer selling more. So that's retailer support. You'll also see these big um, displays. So around Super Bowl time, usually some beer company will go in and build basically a stadium out of cases of beer. And then they've got this big football field thing that they roll out on the middle of it. That is retailer support. Does that make sense? Okay, so do you, would you rather do business with someone that's coming in and helping you sell their product, or would you rather do business with someone that you can't even reach on the phone? Uh, this was pretty obvious, right? Yeah, so the last company that I worked for, I, I sold products, and these products came out of, we had a factory in, there are two factories in Ohio, we have one in North Carolina, we have one in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, different products came out of different factories because the different machines required to make them. And it was so bad, our customer service, if you called the customer service in Ohio 
and asked them for a product that was made in Chicago, they couldn't put the order in. They gave you the number for the Chicago customer service and told you to place your order there. Does that sound like good support? No, that is not good customer support. I hope they've got that fixed. Okay, number five, mail-in rebates. Man, back in the 70s, mail-in rebates were like the thing. And uh, do you see them that much anymore? Sometimes, but not like it used to be. It used to be if you walked into office or stables and you bought anything, there would be like this seven feet long piece of tape would come out of the register with all the stuff for the, the mail-in rebate. Okay, so basically what it is, it's where you, pr you provide proof that you purchased the item along with a form, and then they mail you a check. What do you think is more effective? A mail-in rebate of a dollar or fifteen dollars? Oh, come on. Am I going to waste my time for a dollar? No. Might I waste my time for fifteen dollars? I might. And so what we see is that, and we're going to see this, they actually give us percentages. The higher your mail-in rebate, the more likely people are to cash it in. So the expected value, remember we talked about expected value? If you take the probability that someone's going to, let's say it's a 60% probability that they will do a $15, that they will accept a $15 meal and rebate, that's gonna cost your company $9. Whereas there might only be a 5% chance that they would mail in a dollar rebate. And you say, well, wait a minute, that means it's only expected cost of a nickel. On the other hand, how effective will it be? Not nearly as effective as the 15. So you have to, everything in this life is an optimization, right? Trade-offs. When cross-rival differences on all other factors that influence buyer brand preferences are on balance quite small, companies offering bigger than average mail-in rebates in the wholesale segment will outsell companies offering smaller than average mail-in rebates or no rebates. So that's back to our ceteris paribus when everything else is the same. Um, let's see. Any questions before we jump on to the internet stuff? Did you guys know that it, shoes were so complex? I mean, you just, you think when you need a pair, new pair of shoes, what do you do? You either go down to the shoe store or you jump on Amazon. And it's just amazing what is behind all of this. I recently took a tour of the Springfield Underground and uh, they store groceries out there. And the lady that's in charge out there told us that before your groceries get to you, they have likely passed through four to five different warehouses and distribution centers. Does that blow your mind? It blew my mind. Okay, now moving on to the factor of internet sales. Um, average retail price charged at each company's regional websites. By the way, your websites are by region. Uh, charging a higher online price puts you at a disadvantage, a lower puts you in advantage. Uh, and it's basically the same idea as it was with the um, with the wholesale. The more important price related consideration affecting a company's online sales market share in each region is the amount by which the average online selling price in each region is above or below the regional all company average. So it's exactly the same as the other things we've been talking about. The size of any company's pricing disadvantage or advantage versus its rivals can be decreased and increased by its competitive standing versus rivals on all the other factors. In other words, you can make up for higher prices if you're doing other things well. Number two, search engine advertisement in advertising. When you guys put something into Google, the first few things that show up, what do they say? Sponsored. What, how did they get that sponsor word on? Yeah, they had to pay for it, right? And so Google has what are called AdWords. And so you could go out there and purchase Google AdWords for athletic shoe or whatever particular athletic shoe you're trying to sell. And that would be your search engine advertising. Athletic footwear companies, you tend to use search engine ads to attract more 
footwear buyer traffic to their websites and thereby boost online sales and market share in a region. A company's competitiveness versus rival brands in the internet segment is stronger in a region when its expenditures for search engine advertising is above the average and weaker when it's below. So it's like everything else. Free shipping on online purchases. Is free shipping truly free? No. It's just a matter of who is paying for it. Does that make sense? So one of the things that I look at when I'm buying stuff is I'm looking at the total cost. I'm looking at the cost of the thing plus the cost of the ship. Not everyone is so complex, all right? Sometimes uh, you can, if you, if you say free shipping, it's just gonna attract people. They'll be willing to pay more for the product even though they might have been able to buy it from someone else and pay shipping and come out with a lower price, a lower total purchase amount. Footwear companies have the option to offer free shipping. Uh, and companies enjoy an advantage in a geographic region in securing online sales versus regional rivals that choose not to offer free shipping. However, this advantage is weakened when companies offering free shipping charge considerably higher on line prices. In other words, and what, what is considerably higher? More than enough to cover the cost of free shipping. So if shipping costs you $6 and you're charging an extra $12 per, per pair, not good. If shipping costs you $6 and you're charging an extra $6.25 for your shoes, you might be okay. Um, and where the footwear carries a lower SQ rating and, uh, so, and you know, all the other stuff. It's a, basically, it's, it's, one, it's another setter's paribus argument. Okay, so offering free shipping, if you don't raise the price along with it, what's that gonna do to your profitability? Yeah, it's gonna lower your profitability. What's that gonna do to your earnings per share? It's gonna lower it. What's that gonna do to your ROE? It's gonna lower it. Um, what's that gonna do to your share price? It's gonna lower it. So keep all these things in mind. This whole thing is a balancing act. You're looking for optimizations, not maximizations. Okay, any questions before we move on? The importance of each competitive factor in determining sales and market share. We got these 13 uh, factors. They have differing impacts. This, by the way, this paragraph is exceedingly important. So put a bunch of stars and crap next to this paragraph. And after you get through doing that, we'll talk about it. As a general rule, the three most important competitive factors affecting buyer brand preferences Pairs sold and market share are the price, the SQ rating, and the number of model styles offered. Those are your big three. So when you're thinking about basically the weighting, W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, the weighting of these factors, those are weighted more heavily. The next most influential factors including include the appeal of celebrities endorsing uh, the various rival brands, brand advertising, search engine advertising, company image, brand reputation, the number of retail outlets stocking the company's brand of footwear, and free shipping. The competitive advantages and disadvantages associated with the difference in the number of weeks it takes to de uh, deliver retailer orders, the size of mail and rebates, and the comparable amounts of support provided to retailer in merchandising and promoting their respective brands weigh the least heavily in determining buyer brand preferences for in each company's regional unit sales and market share. Now, they've basically given us, what, three tiers there? And so you see there's the top three, and then there's a middle group, and then there's the bottom group. Does that mean that you can totally neglect the bottom group and be just fine? Absolutely not. But when you're looking at where to put your focus, where to put your money, uh, I'm gonna go with the first three. And then if you've still got brain power and money left over to do other stuff, then I'm going to be looking at that next group. And after that, if you've still got brain power and money left over, I go look at the third set. Also, if you think about uh, the, the reputation of the company falls in the middle tier. Is that right? It falls in the middle tier. Now, remember we said that that thing is a combination of three items and one of those is corporate social responsibility. 
So if we're looking at something that only composes a part of one of the mid tier items, do you think it's extraordinarily important to doing well in the game? No, man, we're talking about, so we've got our important stuff, we've got our middle stuff, and we've got our bottom stuff. And the reputation here is in the middle. And corporate social responsibility does contribute to that, but it's only one of three factors. And so we're looking at one third of the middle factors is this whole corporate social responsibility thing. Have I seen people do well without spending much on, or anything on corporate social responsibility? Absolutely. Have I seen people spend a bunch of money on it and not achieve anything? Absolutely. Have I seen people win even though they've been doing this corporate social responsibility? Yes, but only if they do it consistently year in, year out. By the way, at some point in the game, you're going to say, holy crap, we don't have enough money. And then what are you going to start doing? You're going to look for areas to costs. cut costs. And one of those areas that's not going to immediately impact you is corporate social responsibility, that kind of spending. And so what are you going to do? You're going to cut it. And what is that going to do to the impact of all of those years that you've been investing in it? It goes away, right? And so, uh, you know, feel free to do whatever you want to do on that. But I'm just telling you, due to this nature of it having to be a year in, year out kind of thing, and it's an expenditure that doesn't produce anything immediate in value for the company, uh, it's... It's a little, it's one of the few, it's one of the things that are more dangerous for you to play with in the game. Okay, let's see. Uh, while knowing precisely what these weights are might seem helpful or even essential, such knowledge is not as useful as you might believe. And then we're going to explain why that is below. So let's talk about the cheat sites. Undoubtedly, some of you have already gone out and you have Googled the phrase, how to win the BSG. Undoubtedly, and I don't blame you, I would too, right? And undoubtedly, uh, there's going to be someone who has claimed that they have inside information on, on what the weights are. By the way, these guys are telling us the relative weights of these things. But these crackers are going to tell you that they know, well, this one is 0 0.3792 and this one is 0 0.0042 and they are full of crap. But even, even assuming they were correct, it's not going to be as important as you might think. And that's what we're going to talk about next. How, e how much each competitive factor matters is not a fixed amount. Big price differences in a region matter a lot in accounting for differences in brands sold. But as the spread between the highest price company and the lowest price company becomes smaller and smaller, the weaker that is, is that impact. And so, big differences multiplied by the weight are going to be greater than smaller differences multiplied by the same weight. And so what's more important than knowing those individual weights is knowing what the differences are in your industry. And you guys are going to be getting reports that tell you exactly what's going on in your industry. And so it lets you know where you're at and helps you figure out these differences which we are now being told are more important than the weight. Um, if everybody is charging the same price, then price has a zero impact because they're going to take that price weight and multiply it by zero. Therefore, how, uh, how much price matters in determining a company's unit sales per market in a region is not a fixed amount, but rather is an amount that varies from big when the differences are big to small, when the prices are, differences are small to zero, when all the prices are the same. And precisely the same rationale works for all the other competitive factors too. Next page. When a company's competitive effort on each of the relevant competitive factors in the wholesaler internet marketing segments 
or branded footwear approximates the all company averages in a region, then its resulting unit sales volume per market, unit sales and market share are in those two segments will also approximate the region's all company sales market share averages. In other words, if you're average with your efforts, you're gonna be average with your results. Does that make sense? All unit sales and market share outcomes in all regions are thus 100% competition based and are a function of the size of each company's competitive, ad, competitive advantage disadvantage against the all company averages for the relevant competitive factors. So all the outcomes here are going to be determined by not only your efforts, but who else's? Yeah, the other teams, because after all, we're looking at the average for the entire region. And so if we're all spending more money on advertising, then the industry average is going to be higher. If I want to get a competitive advantage there, I have to spend even more. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, special note, competitive intelligence report. Uh, it is imperative that you review this information to determine how well your company's competitive effort stacked up against the all company averages, on which factors did your company have a competitive edge, and on which factors was your company at a competitive disadvantage. Folks, I'm going to tell you, this is another thing where the game is actually easier than life. Do you think that you get a yearly competitive intelligence report on all of your competitors every year when you're in... No. So I remember when I was a salesman, one of the things that I was supposed to be doing was gathering intelligence. Now, what kind of intelligence are we talking about? What new products are the competitors bringing out? How are they pricing? How many thousands of pounds of whatever are they selling to these people every year? And if I was doing, if I was having a good day, I would come home with huge nuggets of information. If I was having a bad day, uh, I would come home with nothing. But that's how we developed our intelligence. Now, occasionally, you can pay someone for a marketing study. By the way, every marketing study I was ever involved with had um, a price tag of at least a quarter million dollars. And the last one I was involved with was 2002. Can you imagine what inflation adjusted 250,000 bucks would be today? I'm guessing it's like a half million. Anyway, long story short, uh, gathering intelligence through you people is probably the best way to go about that. And by the way, do you think it's possible the people that did the marketing study are just blowing smoke? Absolutely, because people are scumbags. Ignoring the information in the competitive intelligence report puts your company in the risky position of heading into the upcoming year's market contest with little or no clue as to the competitor's prior year prices, SQ ratings, product breadth, brand reputations, and so forth, and the extent to which your company was or was not outcompeted by rivals. I guarantee you there will be at least one team in this room that will find themselves in a world of hurt. And then I will ask, say, well, show me the competitive intelligence report for your team. And they'll say, what do you think they're going to say? Uh, what's that? Right? Don't be that team. Don't be that team. There are lots of, there's lots of information out there to help you, but people who don't use it, uh, as I love the term, little or no clue. People who, who ignore it have little or no clue. Okay, any questions before we move on to strategies? Okay, crafting a strategy to be competitively successful. So, before we get into this, I'm going to tell you a, a basic truth. And that is that having the best strategy in the world is meaningless if you are poor at executing it. And when I say executing, I mean carrying out the plan. You can have the best plan in the world. If you don't carry it out, you stink. On the other hand, what if you have a middle of the road strategy, but you do a really good job in executing it? I've seen people do that and win. Now, why am I telling you this? Uh, first, we're gonna see that it does, the game doesn't favor one strategy over another, but 
when you see other people doing well with a particular strategy, does that necessarily mean that you need to jump in and do the same thing? No, maybe what you need to learn from those people is how to execute. Maybe the problem isn't your strategy. Maybe the problem is all the other decisions you're making. You have wide ranging options for crafting a strategy capable of producing good overall company performance and competing successfully in the global market for athletic footwear. And then they get go into a bunch of different things you can do. The business strategy game absolutely does not have any built in bias that favors one strategy or competitive approach above all the others. This is another one of those lies that you see out on the internet when you're looking up how to do well on the business strategy game they'll say oh yeah you always want to do a blah 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 strategy they're full of it they're full of it okay moving on no company can escape having the competitiveness of its strategy and the overall bio buyer appeal of its branded footwear tested against the competitiveness of the strategies employed by rivals and the overall buyer appeal of rival brands competitive factor by competitive factor and region by region. So let's talk about this next part. So the hard reality is that in every decision round, you and your co-managers, like the management team of rival companies, are challenged to devise a strategy and exert sufficient effort on the relevant competitive factors affecting online sales and wholesale sales to footwear retailers that enables your company to compete successfully enough against rivals to result in sufficiently profitable sales volumes, market shares, and revenues across the four regions. Now let's talk about uh, uh, the way we score this in here is different than if you took this in a strategy class. And that's because this is a finance class. If you took this in a strategy class, they would be heavily weighting something called the best in industry. So that's your score based on the best in industry. And then, you know, they've got other stuff. In here, I am basing it purely on financial factors. And so what does that mean? It means that winning, or that, that being the uh, top scorer isn't necessarily, uh, unless being the bottom scorer doesn't necessarily mean that you're failing. Is there room in this world for more than one successful shoe company? Yeah, there's room in this class for more than one successful shoe company. In fact, I hazard a guess that each, and I've had it happen before, I, I've had industries where every team basically got an A on the game because when I'm not doing that best in industry stuff, I'm not creating any losers. If I'm not creating losers, who do you think is? Are sitting here, right? You guys create winners and losers. I'm not going to, it's, it's called force ranking. I'm not going to force rank anyone to be on the bottom. You could be doing a great job and you just happen to be the fourth scoring team, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the competition based exercise where your company's management team competes head to head against, oh, so yeah, they, they're saying the strategy game is a competition based deal. That's just like in the real world. And uh, just like in the real world, it's the financial results that matter. Let me ask you this. I, I mentioned this last time. Should man, maximizing your market share be your goal? No. I want you guys to keep in mind throughout this entire class, throughout this entire exercise, what is the goal of financial management? Someone in here knew it last time. What's the goal of financial shareholder? Maximize shareholder value? Yeah, maximize shareholder wealth. Maximize shareholder wealth. That's the goal of financial management. I want you to keep that in mind. And when you guys are doing your presentation, what I'm going to be looking for is, did you even consider the goal? Did you consider that? Did you make that one of your priorities or, or your top priority? Now, second thing is we're getting ready to get into unit one, which is over capital structure. And we're going to talk about how every industry, there's a theoretical optimal capital structure. And what that means is that it's a structure that the company should strive to maintain over time. If you just let your debt mature 
What's going to happen to your debt to equity ratio over time? It's going to, it's actually going to go down. If you just allow debt to mature, that means I'm paying it off, right? As I pay off the debt, eventually I get down to zero. You're no longer at that optimal capital structure. And so that's one of the things you need to keep in mind as you go along. Let's say you are growing by leaps and bounds and uh, you are uh, you're using internal equity. By the way, what's internal equity? Where does it come from? Balance sheet. Okay, so we can find this internal equity on the balance sheet. By the way, the balance sheet, we've got assets, we've got liabilities, we've got owner's equity. And over here in the owner's equity, uh, you've got the money that was paid in. So you've got um, common stock and you've got additional paid in capital or capital surplus, whatever you want to call it. And then there's an account that's called, yeah, accumulated retained earnings. That is your internal equity. Now, where does that come from? When the company's making money, any company the money makes and doesn't pay out as a dividend becomes accumulated retained earnings. That's your internal equity. So let's assume that you're doing really well and you're growing your company leaps and bounds and you are funding all of your new equipment because you can with this internal equity. What's that going to do to your debt to equity ratio? It's going to decrease it, right? Because you've got debt on the top. It's staying the same. Let's assume it stays the same and this bottom keeps getting larger, larger, larger. You're dividing by a larger number. You get a smaller number. Does that make sense? And so you can easily lose control of your target ca of your capital structure. And so as you go along, you've got to make um, you've got to make adjustments in order to keep that at that target level. So those are like two big things that I'm going to be looking for when you guys are doing your presentations. Go ahead and write that down. Number one, did they follow the goal of financial management? And number two, did they strive to maintain their target capital structure? Okay, so speaking more about competition, if your company's sales volume and revenues are disappointingly low in certain regions in a given decision round, then it is management's responsibility to adjust the company's strategy and levels of competitive effort to produce better competitive uh, outcomes. It is unwise for a competitively successful company to rest on its laurels because weak performing rivals can be expected to boost their competitive efforts and try to close the performance gap. I, I have lost count of the number of times that I see a team after like four rounds of just kicking everyone else's butt. They're like, yeah, we're great. We can't do anything wrong. And then things start to turn on them. And eventually they end up basically in last place. And so don't be like that. You've got to stick with it all the time. Do you think this really happens in real companies too, where people, oh yeah. Oh yeah, so let's think about um, Xerox. You guys even know about Xerox? So back in the day, uh, way back when, if you wanted a copy of something, you had to sit down and write a copy of it. Well then, we got this, uh, this machine moving forward in time. Uh, Xerox came up with this machine that you could actually just put the sheet of paper on the glass, hit the button, and then it would, the, the, the copy would come out and it looked almost the same as the thing you were copying. It was a miracle. And so Xerox was selling these things like crazy and making money hand over fist. Xerox thought it could do no wrong. Xerox was actually funding a, a laboratory out in California, Palo Alto, that was coming up with all sorts of amazing stuff like computers and all sorts of crazy stuff. And every time that these scientists would go to Xerox um, management, they'd say, well, we really don't want to take the focus away from copiers. By the way, do you think they were able to maintain their competitive advantage in copiers? 
No, most copiers these days come out of Asia, right? What about the products that they turned their back on? Well, uh, how about the, the computer mouse? Have you ever used one of those? That was developed in Xerox Lab. Do you know how much money they got off the computer mouse? Nothing. Um, the, the graphical user interface that we have on Windows, where you go around and point and click and stuff, developed by Xerox. Do you think Xerox ever got a penny off that? No. So much of the stuff that they developed at that research lab could have been highly profitable stuff. But instead, they had this victory disease where they thought they were great, and they thought all they had to do was to continue to churn out copiers. Don't be like that. Well, achieving attractive sales volumes and revenues in the world's athletic footwear marketplace is necessary. It is not sufficient to produce the best profit outcomes. For a company to rank among the industry's top performers, its net revenues must cover costs by an amount that results in profitability. So there's only, sales is only half of this thing, right? You've got costs too. Good profitability requires not only sufficient competitive success to produce attractively large revenues, but also consistent managerial success in operating the company cost efficiently. Operating inefficiencies and wasteful spending impair a company's profitability and overall performance. So you gotta look at two sides. You gotta look at money in, and you gotta look at the money going out. Don't waste your time searching for some magic bullet or undefeatable strategy. There is no such thing. It is conceptually, conceptually impossible for there to be some pre-selected surefire strategy or some undefeatable combination of competitive efforts actions that is guaranteed to produce sufficient sales, market shares, and revenues to propel a company into the ranks of the top performing companies irrespective of the strategies and competitive actions undertaken by rival companies. It is deeply flawed thinking to believe that some predetermined level of competitive effort could be built into the business strategy game that will always turn out to be competitively powerful enough to deliver great overall company performance irrespective of the strategies, actions, and decisions of rivals. I guarantee you, if we played this game twice, do you think we would have the same outcome? No. What are you gonna do? You're gonna take what you learned the first time around and you'll apply it to the second time. You're not, in, unless you're insane, you're not gonna be doing the same things that led you to have problems in the last game. That's exactly like the real world. And so you're going to learn from the prior period, you're gonna apply that to the next period. In fact, you'll see that as we go from year 11, 12, 13, and on to 18. But what's the point here? Because every time this thing runs, it's a different game, there is no possible way for there to be a surefire magic bullet strategy. Be very wary about following the advice of outside sources. You are well advised to be highly skeptical following the advice and tips regarding what to do or what works best that come from prior participants in a business strategy game. Exercise at your school from sources you discover online. Why? because the specific actions and decisions other companies in your class have previously made and are likely to make uh, in upcoming decision rounds are certain to differ, perhaps by a little, more likely by a lot, than those uh, that occurred previously in other industries. To put it a bit differently, the chance that the head-to-head -head competition and outcomes, whatever the past industries produce the tips and advice you have gotten, will closely match the levels of competitive effort in each region that the companies in your industry have already undertaken and will undertake in the future is very small, certainly under 5% and more likely close to zero. The most accurate and dependable source of information for guiding your efforts to compete successfully is always found in the competitive intelligence report you receive after every decision round. Did you guys get that? Put a bunch of freaking stars on that. A bunch of stars on that. You need to look at that competitive intelligence report. And I would tell you that there is another document that is equally important. Hopefully you've got a printout of it right now. And in fact, one of the things when I asked students what made you so successful, they said, we read the player's guide, right? That's how you're gonna know what you need to do. Okay, next time we will be talking about making decisions. Are there any questions?
What do you need to have ready for next time in case we finish the player's guide? Chapter 14, the slides, and you need to read before class. I know that's a strange thing for students to think about doing. You usually read right before the exam, if at all, but go ahead and read beforehand. Use Learn Smart. It forces you into the materials. Do not just read the words. See you next time.